Hi, I'm Brian E. Denton, author of the book A Year of War and Peace and the poetry collection Spiration. Welcome to my channel. This video is part of a series I'm doing on Dante's Divine Comedy, wherein I'm reading through the entire Divine Comedy, the Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, at a rate of three cantos or chapters per week. Right now we're on Inferno, and in fact we're about to wrap it up pretty soon. This is the 30th installment, so we're getting pretty close to the end. This will be followed, as I said, by Purgatorio, and then eventually Paradiso. This is part of my independent contribution to Baylor University's 100 Days of Dante project. If you haven't heard of the 100 Days of Dante project, you really should, so be sure to click through on the link I provide down in the show notes below. If you're a first-time viewer, first of all, welcome. Thank you for joining me. And if you could please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel, that help out a lot. We've set the goal of getting up to 250 subscribers by the end of November. We're about halfway through the month, and we're currently at, I think, 219 or 218 uh, subscriptions. So we're a little bit behind schedule, but that's fine. Whatever. No big deal. But with your help, we could probably get to 250. So thanks in advance for that. A quick note about the organization of these videos. You'll find that they consist of this introduction, followed by a synopsis, where I'll go over you know, the major plot points and the action of the Kanto under discussion. I'll follow that with a characters and themes section, where I will explore the characters and the themes. Then I'll have a takeaway. And in the takeaway section, what I do is I offer my own personal thoughts on the Kanto, and particularly how we can use the Kanto to live better lives ourselves. Finally, I'll wrap things up with an outro, and then after that, you just go wherever the YouTube algorithm takes you, hopefully to another one of my videos, which you'll also like. So with that, let's get right into it then. This video is on Dante's Inferno, Canto 30. Today, Dante the Great Remixer is back with not only one, but two lengthy classical era similes, both of them taken from Ovid's Metamorphoses. The first is about the madness of Athamas, the second about the madness of Hecuba. So right off the bat, you know that you're in for some craziness. And indeed we are, for immediately after these two similes, this crazed shade rushes into the scene and sinks his tusky teeth into poor Capuccio's neck. This shade then drags Capuccio off, tearing open his belly along the rocky, jagged floor of hell. And this leaves behind in its wake just this nasty, bloody trail of guts. Capuccio's companion, Griffolino, then reports that this vampiric shade's name in real life was Gianni Schicchi. Dante then notes that there's another shade waiting nearby. And so he asks Griffolino who this shade is. And Griffolino responds that this is Mira. Mira, of course, is yet another classical era character taken from Ovid's Metamorphoses. Griffolino also reports that this sinner Mira, and also Gianni Schicchi, are sinners who committed during their earthly lives the sin of falsification, and this is why they are being punished in this particular region of hell. At this point, Dante notices another sinner, and this sinner appears to be loot-shaped to Dante, and also this sinner is attached to hell's floor. This guy's not doing too well. He's suffering from thirst and on top of that, on top of being absolutely parched, he also appears to have a very bad case of dropsy. This is Master Adam, as we learn, and his sin is another sin of falsification, the sin of being a counterfeiter. So Dante talks with his counterfeiter, Master Adam, for a little bit. He gets his story, and then he asks him about the other sinners who are collected down here. And Adam shares this information with Dante. One of these sinners that Master Adam speaks about is Potiphar's wife. The other is someone named Sinon, and these are both sinners who committed the sin of impersonation, yet another sin of falsification. Each of these two are possessed by an incurable high fever. Master Adam's identification of these two sinners doesn't really go over too well with them. Apparently, they don't want their names to be known. And so one of them starts beating Master Adam. Master Adam, naturally, in response, starts beating this sinner back, and so a little fisticuffs erupts there on the floor of hell. And Dante is very interested in this. He takes a few moments to stop and really see what's going on. The interest that Dante shows for this little skirmish elicits a very stern and strong rebuke on Virgil's part. Dante is properly chastised by this rebuke and immediately shows repentance for his interest in this fight. Virgil accepts this unspoken apology of Dante's, and the two continue on.
This canto can be a little confusing, what with all its constant references to antiquity and its kind of quick paced plot. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to go by slowly and surely to figure out what's going on in this canto in terms of characters and themes. First, we have these two great opening similes. Both of them are taken from Ovid's Metamorphoses, and both feature the story of a person who goes mad. Both also, and this is important, I believe, so pay attention, both of them have to do with cities that were destroyed. The first simile tells the story of Juno's wrath. So Juno, the story goes, is very upset with Simile, who is the daughter of the Thebian founder Cadmus. And so she, Juno, kills her Simile. Now Juno, it can also be said, is responsible for the murder of Ino, although indirectly. And here's what happens with that. Juno drives King Athamas mad, drives him crazy. And this leads him to murder his wife, Ino, and their children. Keep in mind here that Juno's rage is driven by her disdain and desire for the destruction of the city of Thebes. And Thebes, as we've seen throughout the course of this poem, is a city that will eventually be destroyed. The next simile is the simile that concerns Hecuba and Troy, which, as you know, is another city that gets destroyed. Here, Hecuba, who is the wife of the Trojan king Priam, after the destruction of the city, is carried off by the Greeks. She also witnesses the sacrifice of her daughter and the murder of her son, I believe. And this drives her mad. She goes crazy. Naturally, that's, that's a lot of tragedy to undergo. There are two things that you're going to want to take away from these two similes in terms of the sin of impersonation and of fraud more generally. And those two things are the motif of madness and the motif of the destruction of cities. Madness in these similes is related to the contrapasso associated with the sinners of impersonation. This is Chiani Skiki, who, the one who bites into Capuccio's body and drags him off at the beginning of the canto. And Dante the Poet tells us that Chiani has gone completely mad, if not more mad than the people involved in the opening similes. The contrapasso here is that just as Gianni, an impersonator, stole the personhood of others in his real life, so too now in the afterlife is his own personality stolen from him by means of madness. And I would add to this the idea that the destruction of cities, Thebes and Troy, from the opening two similes, represents the social destruction that we've often talked about while we're down here in Mount that results from the sins of fraud, of which impersonation is a subset. Now let's move on to the next character that we meet. This character is Master Adam. He's the guy who's pinned to the floor of hell whose body appears to Dante to resemble a lute. His sin is that in real life he was a counterfeiter. And this is an interesting one, because here we see Dante the poet going full neoliberal economist. To understand what I mean by this, it's important to first understand the role that prices play in a market economy. Economists often refer to prices as packets of information which bring widely distributed disparate knowledge to interested parties. So prices then share information for producers and consumers alike. Let's say you're a baker, for instance, and you see that the price of sugar is rising. You don't know the specifics of why the price of sugar is rising. All you know is that the price of sugar is rising. But it's not important for you to know the reasons. You just need to know that sugar, for whatever reason, is probably more scarce than it was uh, previously. And so you know that you're either going to need to raise prices of the baked goods that you're producing that contain sugar, or you're going to need to shift production to less in sugar intensive products. So again, the baker doesn't need to have total knowledge of why the prices of sugar are rising. She doesn't need to know why the sugar is more scarce now than it was previously. The increased prices, the packets of information, tell her that. Here's what economist F.A. Hayek has to say about the idea of prices as information. The most significant fact about this system is the economy of knowledge with which it operates, or how little the individual participants need to know in order to be able to take the right action. In abbreviated form, by a kind of symbol, only the most essential information is passed on, and passed on only to those concerned. It is more than a metaphor to describe the price system as a kind of machinery for registering change, or a system of telecommunications which enables individual producers to watch merely the movement of a few pointers, as an engineer might watch the hands of a few dials, in order to adjust their activities to changes of which they may never know more than is reflected in the price movement.
So now that we understand the role of prices in an economy, it becomes clear why counterfeiting is such a great sin. Counterfeiting debases the currency and distorts the price system, thereby confusing society as a whole. Here's what John S. Carroll says in his commentary on Master Adam and Master Adam's counterfeiting project and the punishment, dropsy, that is associated with it. Money is the nearest approach to this constant value yet discovered. And by debasing of the currency, by disturbing this fixed standard, throws society into confusion. Just as in dropsy, one part swells and another pines away. So in the body politic, one section of the community is bloated with wealth, while another grows emaciated with poverty. Now the two sinners that Master Adam will next tell us about, Potiphar's wife and Sinon, are the sinners of perjury. They're punished by means of an overwhelming fever. And most commentators agree that this fever is indicative of a broader unnamed disease. So they're struck by a disease, just as society itself is struck by the disease of their sins, perjury. And this brings us to the scene that concludes today's canto, Virgil's rebuke of Dante. Here's what happens. Dante, intrigued by the fight between Master Adam and Sinon, looks at them both with kind of a, the pointless glance of a rubbernecker at an automobile accident. This infuriates Virgil, who issues a stern rebuke. And Virgil tells Dante, in fact, that, you know, if you don't cut it out with this pointless glancing, then we're going to quarrel. We're going to fight. That's some pretty harsh words. We haven't seen this from Virgil, at least as it pertains to Dante yet. So you know that this is important. And Virgil also says that such ogling on the part of Dante is beneath him, and his interest in such things is base. This exchange brings to mind, at least for me, Christ's rebuke of Peter just before the transfiguration. Here's the account from Matthew. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus rebukes Peter for focusing on the secular rather than the spiritual. For me, this is Virgil's rebuke of Dante. Dante here is focusing on the personal interactions of these two mere humans rather than on the broader spiritually allegorical purpose of his travel through hell up to paradise. This recalls an idea we shared earlier, way back in the video for Canto 3. And that idea is this, that the Divine Comedy is really kind of a layman's poetic iconography. That is, we're intended to use this poem, the Divine Comedy, to contemplate higher spiritual concepts. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, drawing on the words of St. John Damascene, expounds on why iconography is such a powerful and important tool of spirituality. The beauty of the images moves me to contemplation as a meadow delights the eyes and subtly infuses the soul with the glory of God. Similarly, the contemplation of sacred icons, united with meditation on the Word of God and the singing of liturgical hymns, enters into the harmony of the signs of celebration, so that the mystery celebrated is imprinted in the heart's memory, and is then expressed in the new life of the faithful. So to reiterate, what I believe Virgil is so upset about here is that Dante, by focusing on these two sinners fighting, is abandoning the purpose of his journey. And his journey, of course, is one of spiritual renewal and contemplation. And I think Virgil will be mad at you too if you're not doing the same with Dante's verses. Poetic Iconography From a Virgilian perspective, we could say that our experience in Maubolge is like a hamburger, wherein the patty is disgusting, awful punishments, and the buns are angry disappointment. Hey, my similes are trash. I'm not claiming to be one of the greatest poets of all time. What I mean by this ridiculous simile is that we both start and end our time in Maubolge with Virgil in a very foul mood. Remember that at the start, he was mad and upset. 
He was mad and upset because he couldn't get Dante, his charge, into the city of Dis without the help of the angel who came down from heaven to clear the path away. So this upset Virgil. And now at the end of Mabolge, Virgil is upset again, only this time at Dante himself. And what is he upset about? He's upset with Dante because Dante, as we discussed in the characters and themes section, is letting his attention drift from spiritual concerns down to mere secular concerns. This upsets Virgil, as it should. So to reiterate, to be clear, what Dante is doing wrong here is that instead of focusing his attention on spiritual concerns, which is the entire purpose of his journey through hell, he's allowing himself to waste time focusing on this skirmish between these two sinners. And there's nothing spiritually edifying about this at all. Virgil, as Dante's guide on this spiritual journey, rightly recognizes this error and rebukes him for it. In our life, we need to act as our own Virgils, constantly and consistently vigilant about focusing ourselves on what is truly important and doing our best to avoid any lapse in this proper focus. So as you go about your day, remember the wise words of our old friend Marcus. We ought then to check in the series of our thoughts everything that is without a purpose and useless, but most of all, the overcurious feeling in the malignant. All right, that concludes my video for Canto 30 of Dante's Inferno. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Remember that we're trying to get up to 250 subscribers by the end of November, and with your help, I'm sure we can get there. But more importantly than getting likes to the video or subscriptions to the channel is getting a conversation going down in the comments below. So let me know what you thought about this canto or the poem in general. Let me know what you thought about my opinion on the, on the canto or the poem in general. Very interested to hear what you have to say. Aside from leaving a comment in the comment section, if you want to contact me, you can also do that on Twitter. My handle is at Brian E. Denton. Other than that, we're going to be releasing these videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The next video is going to be released on Wednesday. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.